afternoon. Thank you for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. My name is Brittany Howell and my colleague Lori and I will be managing this session. We're fortunate today to be joined by Bill Williams, the Information and Education Supervisor for the Pennsylvania Game Commission's Northeast Region. He'll be talking to us about the extinction of the passenger pigeon. We expect the presentation to last about 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer period of about 10 minutes. You can ask questions by typing into the type question here box on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right of your screen. Before we get started, we'd like to do a quick audio check. So let us know if you can hear us by typing into the box. For those of you who are dialing in to listen by phone, please note that this is not a toll free call and you may receive long distance charges from your service provider. So it sounds like you can hear us. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our presenter, Bill. Would you like to share a little bit about your background before we get started? Sure, thanks, Brittany. Uh, my name is William Williams. It's an easy name to remember. Uh, I'm the Information and Education Supervisor. I work uh, with the Pennsylvania Game Commission's Northeast Regional Office in Dallas. Uh, I was a district officer in Sullivan County for seven years, went into land management, and now I've been the Information or INE Supervisor for about the past five years up in Dallas there. And today's program is actually about an extinct bird, the passenger pigeon. Uh, the Pennsylvania Game Commission is uh, charged with managing wildlife and its habitat for current and future generations. And we currently manage about 480 species of wildlife here in Pennsylvania. Uh, this, this presentation is aimed at answering one specific question, and that is, what caused the wild population of the most numerous bird species in North America go from a populations that were in the billions to none in just a few decades? And as a follow-up uh, question there is what are state and federal agencies like the Game Commission doing now to prevent such a catastrophe from happening again? Uh, so we're going to start off in the Cincinnati Zoo. The year is 1914. It is late summer and people are flocking from miles around uh, all over the world to visit the zoo. And most of them are visiting the aviary uh, or aviary row, which is a series of these seven pagoda type buildings that house the very rare and unique birds of the world. In one of those buildings, uh, there is a bird whose name is Martha. And uh, Martha is a passenger pigeon. She is a she, uh, a female passenger pigeon, and the reason people are flocking to see her is not because she is any different physically or has any different attributes than the other birds that preceded her. They're coming to see her because she is the last of her species. The last male passenger pigeon named George, and you can see the connection there, died in 1911, uh, about three years earlier. But passenger pigeons were not black and white. They were very colorful birds. In fact, so one ornithologist actually said they, the passenger pigeon was a bird of transcendent beauty. Uh, you can see that it looks a little bit like a morning dove, but it's about two to three times larger. The illustration you're looking at here uh, graced our August 2014 issue of Game News. And up until that time, it was the only extinct species of animal that was ever on the cover of Game News. Uh, there is also a nice article in this issue by Joe Kosak. The bird itself was about had about a two foot wingspan, about 16 inches in length, uh, two to three times the size of a morning dove, and the males were very beautifully covered or colored with a slate blue head. Uh, the sides had this beautiful metallic gold and violet. And as you can see, the breast was a bright orange. The females were a little muted in color, uh, but they did have some nice coloration also. Um, and these birds were capable of flight uh, about 60 miles per hour when migrating. And these, uh, these birds were built for speed and to travel long distances. The scientific name of the passenger pigeon, Ectopistes migratorius, and I'm glad I got that out, by the way, is called uh, is actually means wandering migrant. Now that may sound a little redundant, but these birds flew in enormous flocks in the spring to get to the northern breeding grounds. So they did migrate, and once they were in their roost, they wandered quite a distance to forage for food. So that name is actually pretty good. 
the word passenger is actually corrupted from the French passagier, which means a traveler or one that passes by, because most people, when they saw these birds, they were passing overhead. What this bird is not is the type of pigeon that we see in uh, our cities, uh, commonly called a rock dove. That's an introduced species of bird uh, from Europe. Uh, they are sometimes called the carrier pigeon or homing pigeon. Uh, it's not related to that bird whatsoever. In fact, early settlers simply called the passenger pigeon either a pigeon or a wild pigeon. So there's no confusion with the birds that we see in our, in our cities today. So this bird, the population of the passenger pigeon, depending on the estimate, when our European settlers arrived, was anywhere from five to six billion birds uh, in North America, and that number is sometimes higher. So despite this population, and it was in the billions as late as the 1860s, it was completely wiped out within about 40 years. Now, how did that happen? The first thing we have to do is look at the range of this bird. And I'll start off with the breeding range. You can see that inner circle there is where the birds, when they would fly from the southern states, would establish their nesting colonies. It encompasses most of the New England states, all of Pennsylvania notably, and as far west as uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. It was a bird of the eastern deciduous forest. That, and they were dependent on this area called the snow belt because of the food supply that they, were, that they fed upon, which you'll learn about in just a minute. After the breeding season, they could go just about anywhere into Canada, uh, very rarely west, west of the Rocky Mountains, but they were primarily birds that essentially inhabited the eastern part of the United States and, and North America. Passenger pigeons had a varied diet. They ate uh, fruits, they ate insects, they ate grain. Uh, but they were absolutely dependent upon hard mast in the form of acorns and beech nuts and to a lesser extent chestnuts. That area of their breeding ground you'll notice is sometimes referred to as the snow belt. They established their breeding colonies in areas where this hard mast was on the ground from the year before. Being in the snow belt, the snow came early so a lot of these nuts were left on the ground. They weren't forged by other birds and mammals and they were available to the pigeons to establish their roost because the young of the year would be feeding on the ground on these uh, acorns and beech nuts. If people know one fact about the passenger pigeon is that, is that they flew in enormous flocks. Uh, when you read the literature on passenger pigeons, you almost always will find the description of these flocks blocking out the sun and turning a sunny day into darkness because there were that many birds. Uh, Alexander Wilson, who was our, one of our premier ornithologists in North America, was actually in Kentucky uh, one spring day when one of these massive flocks started flying overhead. And being the biologist that he is, he wanted to quantify approximately how many birds were in this flock. He estimated this particular flock to be about a mile wide several strata deep, so it was just a matter of waiting for this flock to fly overhead. And it took four hours for this flock to fly past his location. Traveling at 16 mi 60 miles per hour, he made a few calculations and determined that this particular spring migration flock contained 2,230,272,000 birds. And that's give or take a few, I'm sure. <laughs> So some people were drawn to metaphor, just to try to simply describe what they were seeing. We see nothing like this today. Although Leopold said the passenger pigeon was a biological storm uh, traveling across the landscape. As you could imagine, a flock this size is going to leave a great amount of dung on the ground. And uh, people described when passenger pigeons went through an area, one of these large flocks, that the ground would look like it just snowed because there, there was that many droppings from the passenger pigeon. Arlie Shorger, uh, who literally wrote the book on passenger pigeons, said that viewed from all angles, this bird was the most impressive species of bird that man has ever known. Some pretty strong words. Audubon reported a flight that darkened the sky for three entire days. Toward the later part of the passenger pigeon's time here on Earth, 
a nesting in Wisconsin in 1871 was estimated to sprawl over 850 square miles and involved over 136 million birds. So there's really nothing today that we can compare these numbers with. We have a lot of bird species that fly in great flocks, but certainly nothing like this bird used to do. When they landed in their breeding grounds, uh, birds would literally pack the trees. Every branch would have birds in it, and so many would alight that thick boughs would break, and entire trees would sometimes come crashing down. Up our way in the Northeast, our GIS expert um, uh, put together a little map of a passenger pigeon nesting colony that was reported in Sullivan County uh, based on a report by a fellow named Otto Bear, which is near the Lopez area. Uh, we mapped this in an area and found out that where he described was along a creek bottom. And it wasn't uncommon for these birds to start filling up a creek bottom where there was beech and oak and filling up the sides until these colonies were established. This particular one, which was on game lands uh, 66, I'm sorry, 13 up in Sullivan County, measured about 21 square miles. Every tree in that area filled with passenger pigeons, the whole area encompassing about 13,000 acres. I looked at this the other day and realized one thing, that this particular uh, pigeon roost, uh, as big as it was, was actually smaller than the average, just to give you some size uh, for comparison. The bird laid uh, a single egg, uh, so it didn't have a high reproductive rate, and it laid it in a nest that was kind of flimsily made. Generally speaking, the reports are that you could look underneath the nest and probably see the egg. Nothing to speak of for the nest itself. Uh, both male and female birds tended to the egg uh, to get it incubated, and in about 12 days, the young would hatch, and as in all pigeon species, they're referred to as squabs. And this is the only known photograph of a passenger pigeon squab that was taken while it was alive. Kind of an ungainly looking bird. Uh, one Detroit newspaper described it as a featherless, hairy, misshaped, ugly little wretch of a bird. Now that's kind of some harsh words, but uh, they were, they certainly grew very quickly because they were fed pigeon milk from the adults and pigeon milk is kind of a tapioca-like substance that was uh, created in the esophagus of the, the, male, uh, the adult birds and they were fed to these chicks and they grew very rapidly. Uh, Native Americans were quite fond of, of taking these birds when they were just ready to fledge. Their bones were softer. They had uh, plenty of meat, and the fat from the chicks was used much like we would use butter or shortening today. And Native Americans did utilize the bird. Uh, this illustration here shows passenger pigeons uh, amongst a group of, of Native Americans. The Seneca India, Indians refer to passenger pigeons as big bread, because during the spring they would provide much needed nutrition to the tribes after a long winter. Uh, they even had, uh, saw, and still do have songs and dances related to this bird. Of course, in the spring, arrival of flocks were very uh, welcomed by uh, our early settlers. As they flew toward their destinations of their roosting grounds, in many cases they would fly close enough to the ground where they can be shot with a, a shotgun or other type of firearm, and really there was no aiming involved. Uh, considering the size of these flocks, all one had to do was simply lift a gun into the air and shoot, and a number of birds would drop from the sky. However, this bird was also a crop pest to some of our early settlers, and they would feed upon the grain that was trying to be planted. So it was kind of a double-edged sword there. The earliest account of killing a passenger pigeon was in Maine uh, in 1605. Uh, at this time, the birds were shot and netted for food, for personal use, and as small uh, local towns started to appear on the landscape in North America, uh, they were sold in local and regional markets. You can see in this illustration, the person is using a blind, or what they used to call a bow house, uh, set up waiting for passenger pigeons to alight into an area that he 
more, more likely has mated with grain. Pigeons were all also shot and killed in a number of different ways while they were on the roost in, in these nest, huge nesting colonies. And it would be hard for me to describe the scene of a, individuals going into a roosting area and, and shooting pigeons. They were killed in a number of different ways. One of the ways is simply cut the trees down and have access to the nest and the squabs that were in those trees. Uh, they were also uh, shot with arrows that had blunt tips on them. There were guns were used and as you can see in this depiction long poles were used to bounce or pop the young squabs out of the nest and collect it in that manner. In another way of collecting them was in those days to use a pot at the base of a tree, uh, put sulfur in it, set that on fire and it would asphyxiate a number of birds, they would come down and they would be harvested that way. At this time, however, uh, large cities were not in place and the population still remained fairly stable. One of the ways of, of capturing a passenger pigeon, and these were developed over the years, was to use a net trap. Uh, pigeoners, as they were called, would take a net that was usually around 30 feet by 40 feet. Uh, they would bait the area in front of the net with grain. The net would be put in place folded using long poles and there would be a trip wire that ran down to the blind or the bow house. Now they used some interesting techniques to lure flocks of birds to this nest. The pigeoner generally had two live birds that he used as decoys. The first was called a flyer. It was simply a passenger pigeon that had a long string attached to it. When a flock would come into range, they would release the flyer. That bird would fly into the air, hopefully attract the flock, and then that pigeon would be pulled back to the hunter. As the flock drew closer, they used another technique. Uh, this was a pigeon, a live pigeon, that was attached to a board that was kind of like a lever, or if you can imagine, a seesaw and this could be manipulated by the hunter inside of the blind. They called this contraption a stool. So the pigeon was placed on the stool and when the flock came even closer, the stool was raised up and down. The pigeon would flap its wings trying to gain its balance, but it would look like a pigeon alighting in that area. And hopefully for the hunter that the flock would think that the area was safe, they would come in to land, the trap would be set, the net would come over, and in this way, 30 to 40 dozen, which amounts to about 360 to 48 pigeons in one netting was considered a good, good catch. So how did that end up in our vernacular? The word stool pigeon, which I believe most people have heard of as a phrase, was eventually meant to mean one who betrays his friends. So when you hear that phrase stool pigeon, now it's not used very much anymore, but it means someone that betrays their friends. As cities began to increase, market hunting became more popular. Bigger cities demanded meat, and all types of wildlife were being sent to the cities to supply, to supply them with wild game, and passenger pigeons were sent in very large numbers. They had a price on their head. People became pigeoners. Uh, their job year-round was to trap or kill pigeons for the market. This is an photo, old photograph of an individual by the name of Albert Cooper with his live passenger pigeon decoys, and he is a pigeoner. Uh, these numbers doubled from 600 to, in 1874 to over 1,200 in 1881. So year round, pigeons were relentlessly targeted for the market. Trap shooting was also another way that pigeons were exploited. This was very popular in the 1850s and beyond, and it could account for approximately a million birds or more being killed per year after being netted, taken to the trap shoots, and killed for these particular sporting events. Uh, in Coney Island, New York in 1874, over 45,000 birds were used during one trap shoot in one day. Weather could sometimes come into play. These birds came in late March and early April, and if you had inclement weather or a snowstorm, it could kill off large numbers of birds before they had a chance to establish their, 
their nursery colonies. The one-two punch for the destru destruction of pop passenger pigeon populations, that's a lot of P's to use in a row, <laughs> was the establishment of the railroads and along every railroad line the telegraph. This did two things. It gave hunters easy access to the passenger pigeon roosts in the spring, and it also gave them a way to remo remove the birds and get them to the major cities. Telegraph lines lined all of these railroads, so now communications improved. So when these flocks appeared in the spring, they were simply radioed across the telegraph, everyone knew about it, and people descended upon the flocks to take advantage of that. And if you look at this particular map, think about earlier where the passenger pigeon had its nesting colonies established. You could see that it is now crisscrossed with railroad lines, and along all those railroad lines are telegraphs, defeating the uh, nesting unpredictability of the bird. When one of the larger nestings in Wisconsin in 1871, this is a few estimates, you could fit 100 passenger pigeons in one barrel, uh, salted down. Uh, these trains were carrying 300 barrels per day. The nesting roost uh, period lasted for about 40 days. So in one nesting in one year, they were able to eliminate 1.2 million passenger pigeons from the population. Things were not looking good at this point. Uh, the nesting colonies were being heavily like, exploited. Habitat was starting to decrease and the population was dropping. Uh, this is a record from Sullivan County, kind of gives you an idea of, of that drop, and this could be anywhere in the north central regions or the northwestern states. Uh, in 1870, they were there by the thousands. 82 small flocks appeared. By 1986, they weren't seeing hardly any passenger pigeons at all in that area. Pennsylvania forests were becoming deforested. Uh, we were reduced to 20 to 25 percent forest cover by the late 1800s. So flocks were being more and more concentrated in the remaining habitat for them, uh, beech and, and uh, oak forest. Flocks had fewer places and the nests became concentrated. We saw the largest flocks on record occur uh, in the late 1800s, two of those areas, uh, one in Michigan and one is in Wisconsin. The one in Wisconsin was probably the biggest, estimated at 850 square miles, 136 million birds all in the same area. And one interesting note is one gun dealer so, sold 512 rounds of ammunition during that period. In 1878 in Petoskey, Michigan is considered to be the last great flocks. Our wild records in North America, when did we last see these birds in the wild? In 1895, the last egg of a, and nest of a wild bird was taken in Minneapolis. And incidentally, that's the first year the Game Commission was established. In 1898, the last bird was killed in Canada. 1900, the last immature in Ohio. 1901, the, the last bird, the adult male that was shot, we still have a specimen for in Illinois. And finally, on April 3rd, uh, 1902, the last wild bird, adult male, was shot in Laurel, in Illinois. So that's it for the wild populations. The rest were in zoos. So that brings us back to Martha. Uh, I, I told you a few things about Martha, but I didn't tell you everything about her. Uh, she was actually uh, born in a captive flock in Chicago uh, and was sent to the Cincinnati Zoo in 1902. As I mentioned, the last male died in 1911. It was a Tuesday, um, September 1st, 1914. She was found uh, dead at the bottom of her cage, and that was the end of the passenger pigeon as far as a living species. People recognized that this was kind of an important event, as sad as it was, and that Martha was, in fact, a, a critical key component of the history of this bird. She was frozen in a 300 pound block of ice and sent by a train to the Smithsonian Institute and that's where you would find Martha today. She never knew flight, uh, but in, in death she flew first class to San Diego 
1966 and to the Cincinnati Zoo in 1974. And now that pagoda that housed her is a national historic site. So why did this happen? Uh, a couple reasons. Number one, the passenger pigeon laid a single egg at a low re reproductive rate. It relied on these mass trees, which were unpredictable from year to year. Uh, they, they nested in very dense colonies, so hunters and trappers could take advantage of that. They were, at least in the springtime, in one concentrated area. They were a crop pest, so they were shot for crop damage. Technology, railroads and telegraphs, really sent the population uh, rocketing to earth. Commercialization, they were sold it's for food and sport. They had predictable daily patterns when they were in their roost nesting that you can, you can time your watch by when the males left and when the females came back. Deforestation and fragmentation played a role, but I'd like to make one point. Pennsylvania certainly had enough habitat to support passenger pigeons uh, up until the late 1890s right here in Pennsylvania, so it wasn't the only factor involved as far as habitat loss. They were exploited to the very end, uh, causing failed nestings. Nowadays, when we have species that are in trouble, we, we protect them. Up at the, in that point, there was no such thing. There were no meaningful laws to afford protection to these birds. And there was no conservation ethic. There was no thought to try to stop the relentless slaughter and reestablish passenger pigeon populations. What did they leave behind? They left behind uh, place names. Here in Pennsylvania, there are at least 28 names of places in Pennsylvania that have the word pigeon in it. And almost all of these refer to the passenger pigeon. There is even a town in Forest County called Pigeon, and you can see the historical sign there, and noting that. The most humorous, I believe, is a section of Philadelphia called Moya Mensing, which literally means pigeon droppings. And who can talk about the passenger pigeon place names without talking about Dolly Parton? Now, Dolly Parton is certainly one of our most uh, uh, beloved entertainers, uh, singer and songwriter and musician. But she's also known for establishing a theme park called Dolly World, which is located in a place called Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, uh, so named because of the passenger pigeons that used to flock there. And you know, I'm an eternal optimist. I go to Sullivan County every year, and I go to Pigeon Creek and wait for the flocks to come, but I can tell you, report to you that I have not seen any come back yet. There are passenger pigeons was not the uh, last extinct bird in Pennsylvania, nor is it, the, uh, uh, is it the most current. The great auk disappeared in North America in the 1850s. Carolina parakeet in 1918, again in the Cincinnati Zoo, also on the cover of our game news in July. The heath hen disappeared at Martha's Vineyard in, in 1932, and the Labrador duck, which migrated through Pennsylvania in the 1880s, 1870s. So what have we learned? Uh, we've learned that if we don't conserve wildlife, that we can lose it. Uh, some important legislation came out in the early 1900s. The Lacey Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, were introduced protecting federally, birds, uh, federally uh, these birds. In Pennsylvania, the Game Commission was established. We introduced uh, legislation and laws that protected all birds, even common birds. We have a threatened and endangered species list uh, in Pennsylvania. And currently, there are 20 birds on that list, uh, some through habitat loss, like the short-eared owl, uh, the American bittern, uh, the peregrine falcon, and the osprey. And before the diversity bi biologists jump up and down, I realize that the osprey is no longer on the TNE list because it did not become extinct. It's because it became recovered. And that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to recover birds that are in peril. A good website to visit if you're interested in, in more information is the, Pro the Project Passenger Pigeon website on the web, a great place for educa educators and, and teachers to go to find out more information about this bird. What do we teach our children? Uh, I think this, this topic of an extinct bird 
particularly the passenger pigeon, is a great introduction to talk about threatened and endangered species to our young people and the importance of keeping common species common. Uh, the bird died once, uh, went extinct once in a literal sense, but I think if we forget about uh, birds like this, then we are really causing another type of extinction to occur. And I will leave you with a, a beautiful portrait of Martha uh, flying away from the Cincinnati Zoo, leading a flock of passenger pigeons up into the sky. And at this point, I'll take any questions if anyone has any. All right, to get us started off, can you um, describe a little bit more about their size, say sure. in comparison to a crow or something like that? Uh, pro about crow size, uh, if you look at a morning dove, I always say it's a morning dove on steroids, uh, similar looking, but uh, about two to three si times larger. So about the size of a crow, but built much more for speed and endurance than a crow is. What kind of bird species would you think is our most numerous bird now in Pennsylvania? Well, I, I'd only be guessing at that when I see flocks of uh, uh, snow geese and things like that. It may remind me of, of birds flying in those numbers. Certainly starlings can create that, uh, that appearance in the sky of having uh, huge swirling flocks, but there really is, is nothing like the passenger pigeon and the numbers that they had. Uh, literally at one time in Pennsylvania and in North America, uh, one out of every four and what, maybe even one out of every three bird species was a passenger pigeon. There were that many. Why did the passenger pigeon have such a high cost for its head, high price? Well, uh, food primarily, uh, the, these, uh, these cities that were growing up, there was a demand for wild game and the passenger pigeon was not, uh, not immune to that. They really didn't sell for much per bird, probably less than a penny. So as far as one bird being valuable, not very much, but in the numbers that were sent there, they were used uh, uh, for not only food for the meat, but also you, the fat was used as uh, kind of a, mar uh, a butter or to cook in and like we would use shortening today. Why did the pigeons flock in such large numbers? Well, that's a good question. And like most birds that flock in large numbers, you hear the phrase, there's uh, their strength in numbers, and uh, they did get a lot of predation, especially from avian species. Uh, goshawks were big on killing uh, passenger pigeons, Cooper's hawks, peregrine falcons. When they were in their nesting grounds, they were predated by all sorts of animals. Raccoons would get into their nests. Uh, when the chicks were on the ground, any type of predator, uh, bobcats, uh, bears, would, would feed on passenger pigeons. So when they established these huge numbers, uh, that was nature's way of, of realizing that a great number of those were going to be lost through predation. What birds are related to it um, so that we can have a chance at preventing this from happening in the future? Well, uh, as far as a relative of the passenger pigeon, the only living relative that, that is known in North America is called the band-tailed pigeon that's only found in the western states. However, when you look at any species that is in our, on our threatened endangered species list, those are the ones that are in peril uh, here in Pennsylvania. So the Game Commission is doing everything in its power to make sure that these species of birds, and I use the osprey for, as an example, that these species of birds are provided with quality habitat and uh, that they are protected uh, through the game law and federal law so that their populations can rebound. And, and we're seeing that in a number of species over the years. The bald eagle is a classic example. Um, the osprey is another one, and other birds are rebounding because of, uh, of different types of, of work we do on our game lands. One of our participants said that there has been talk about cloning to bring <laughs> back the passenger pigeon, and they would like to know your thoughts about that. OK, yes, there is. Um, uh, a the project, I believe, is called Revive and Restore. Uh, it is a, an attempt to uh, use passenger pigeon DNA, which there is plenty of, and combine that. Now, I'm not a geneticist, but combine that with the, uh, the band-tailed pigeon and produce a, uh, a cloning, if you will, 
that would reproduce the the passenger pigeon in some form. This organi organization recognizes that this is, if it can even be done, is decades into the future, and it does bring up some ethical questions uh, concerning: Do we really want to go down that road to create what you may call a Franken pigeon? Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is, but uh, but there is certainly an attempt to do that, and if certainly if you Google uh, passenger pigeon cloning, that that will come up, and you can learn more about it there. How do you think that predators adapted, in addition to reduction in numbers, to this kind of passenger pigeon loss? Do you think it impacted other species numbers? Uh, yeah, certainly the passenger pigeon had effect on, on a number of species. And for example, uh, I'll give a tree species first. They preferred red oaks over white oaks. So in some areas, being that they did not eat the white oaks uh, as much, these trees tended to, to, to populate. Some of the hawk predators in the literature, you'll, you, you'll see some speculation that their numbers declined or they may have moved out of areas where these birds were normally uh, common and, and their numbers were reduced. So they did have uh, some effect uh, on, on reducing predator populations where they were at. All right. Well, thank you for those questions. Those were great questions. And thank you, Bill, for sharing you. your expertise. This session has been recorded, and you should receive an email with a link to the recording within the next few days. The recording will also be uploaded to the Game Commission's YouTube channel, where captions will be auto-loaded. We'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon, and we hope that you'll be able to join us again to learn more about Pennsylvania wildlife in upcoming webinars. Feel free to send us an email if you have a suggestion for a webinar topic. You can see that on the screen there. And until then, we hope you're able to get outside and enjoy some of Pennsylvania's great outdoors.